Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Decouple Podcast, where we explore the science and technologies that can decouple human well-being from its ecological impacts, and the politics that can make decoupling possible. Welcome back to Decouple. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Geraldine Thomas, who is a senior academic and chair in molecular pathology at the Faculty of Medicine of Imperial College London. She's an active researcher in the fields of tissue banking and molecular pathology of thyroid and breast cancer. She's also the director of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank and has uh, become quite an expert on issues of the effects of uh, radiation, uh, particularly following nuclear accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima. So Jerry, welcome back to Decouple. You were on, I think in episode six, I think this is probably episode 56. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, been wonderful, uh, you know, having that as a reference episode and, and thanks for coming back on. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Chris. So Jerry, I think um, the story I wanted to, to touch on with you, it's, it's raging in the media. I like to handle sort of breaking stories. Um, and that is the fact that the Japanese government, I think, has finally decided on a controlled release of the tritiated water that has been stored yeah. at the Fukushima site. Um, yeah. And I believe, again, this is supposed to be over a 10 year period, but it has created quite the uproar. Um, and I, sh I should say not only with um, environmental NGOs, uh, most predominantly Greenpeace, but also with regional governments, which I found really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, these are big numbers. Uh, and, and I think they play into, you know, fears and, and, you know, ideas around industries that are, you know, dumping a contaminant that that is something that I think people are, are scared of, and sometimes for very good reasons, but it's 1.25 million tons of treated tritiated water. So can you tell us a little bit about that water? Um, it has been treated and, you know, where it's coming from and, and what the plan is. Yeah, where, where the water came from was when they were washing coolant through the, um, the reactor site. Um, but also you've got flow of water down off the hills into the, into the site as well. So some of that was, was water that came from groundwater as well. Um, and what they did was to store the water and then they took the, what, what people would regard as the nasty stuff out, things like the actinides and things like that, out of it. And that you're left basically with, with tritium, which as it's hydrogen, you can't extract it from the water. So you're stuck right. with it in the water. So there are there are massive tanks that are just holding this water full of tritium, which is actually a, a fairly small amount of radiation in a very large volume of water. So although it may be several million tons of water, actually the amount of tritium in there is is not as huge as you might think. Yeah, I'm, I'm blanking. Someone made the calculation for me, and it was it was something very small, like on the order of several grams. You know, and I guess I mean we're talking about billions of atoms, and it's the smallest atom around. But but still, it's it's interesting how it's how it's reported, the numbers that are used, uh, you know, are... The big, big numbers are frightening. Yeah. But the other thing, you have to put that into some context, where are you going to put it? You're going to put it in the Pacific Ocean. Oh, that's a pretty big body of water as well. Yeah. So there will be a huge dilution effect of, 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 the, um, of, of putting it in the Pacific Ocean. And for me, I've always wondered why it's taken them so long to get to this point. Right, um, right. Because storing that water in those big tanks is fine, providing there wasn't another earthquake. Then you get a major leak. Right. And then if you handle the publicity around that, right. people would be in an absolute uproar. So, yeah. so for me, this, this is a rather a long time coming. I, I was hoping they'd get around to this. I think it's in two years' time they actually start yeah. putting it in the sea. And I mean, I think one of the reasons why it might have taken so long is statements from Greenpeace, like, quote, uh, the uh, Greenpeace Japan says radionuclides discharged into the sea may damage the DNA of humans and other organisms. Um, so let's, um, and, and I should also say again, like, because I was, I was surprised when I was researching that there's also been strong statements from uh, China, which, you know, China is sort of leading the world in, in a nuclear build out right now. They're, they're, uh, projected to have, I think, the most nuclear plants in the world outpacing the US by 2040, maybe. Um, yeah, you also so have to the, the Korea and China aren't that fond of Japan either. Yeah, <laughs> so I wonder why. <laughs> it's politics rather than science. It gives them a big stick to bash a neighbor that they're not particularly fond of as well. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, there's, there's absolutely no question of this from a scientific point of view. There is no problem 
with being exposed to tritium in the levels that you're likely to be exposed of. It's, it's the old situation of the long physical half-life um, versus the short biological half-life. You know, the, the, the half-life of tritium is something like 12 years, but actually it will only stay in your body for around about, I think it's um, seven to 14 days. Right. So actually you're not gonna get a very big dose and it's a weak, it's a pathetic beta emitter. So the only way you get exposure is to take it in yeah. And you're not going to be exposed to very much because you've got a very short biological half-life compared with its physical half-life. So just, just to define a few terms, because you know most of my listeners are pretty well informed on, on physics and chemistry, but I sure wasn't um, a year or two ago, despite my medical degree. I studied physics and forgot it after the exam. <laughs> um, but tritium is a hydrogen atom with two protons, um, which makes it weakly radioactive. Um, and that's, again, why it can't be separated um, from water. I guess you'd have to do like... <laughs> Um, electrolysis of the water. Maybe you could do green uh, hydrogen got oxygen, with it. Which is slightly flammable coming off as well. So, yeah, uh, yeah. It's not a very safe chemical process, never mind anything else. What, one thing that I found really, really interesting, like is tritium um, is not only relevant to Japan, I mean, it's created in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays, um, also by nuclear power plants at very, very low doses. Um, and, and there's a lot of uproar about it in the anti nuclear community. Um, and, you know, one of the comparisons I made, because, you know, it's, this is, people say, well, it's an internal emitter, it's, you know, it's water, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be incorporated into DNA structure, or it'll be right next to the DNA, because there's water in cells. And, you know, my thought about this was, well, let's compare it to another, um, you know, probably one of the predominant, um, you know, intracellular cations. Um, and, one of the, sub the radioisotopes that we have in the highest concentration in our body, which is uh, potassium 40. Um, and I was comparing the energy of that beta decay. So the beta decay is an electron shooting off, right? That's one of the three types of radiation. Uh, so it's 18,000 electron volts for tritium. Um, mm -hmm. and it's a million 300,000 for potassium 40. That's and this what I mean, it's a pathetically weak beta emitter. Yeah. It's like waving a feather at your DNA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I always find that kind of an interesting comparison, because, uh, you know, again, I think there's just this perception that the world isn't radioactive at all, that it's this kind of virgin place. And artificial radiation is the only source of radiation, and that it's this enormously significant amount. Well, I mean, there's huge amounts of uranium sloshing around in the sea that's come from erosion of rocks. And I mean, I always find it a, a rather ridiculous thing that we're, we're panicking about small amounts of radioactivity, as we are with, with, with tritium at the moment. When you look at the amount of uranium that's sloshing around in the world seas, it's something like three micrograms per liter. Right. I don't think how many liters of water there are in the world's ocean. That's a hell of a lot of uranium. And in fact, if we could extract it from the sea, we'd never have to mine it again. Right. Because we'd only have to fuel our nuclear plants. The trouble is, it's too expensive, so we can't do it. Right. But right. It, it, people think that we are not exposed to natural radiation at all, but you cannot avoid it. If you go swimming in the sea, you're going to be exposed to uranium. We don't panic about it though. I think it's probably because people just don't know it's there. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's also tons of potassium 40 in the ocean with 70 times the, yeah. the beta decay power of, uh, <laughs> of tritium. So we've kind of got the tritium out of the way. And, and uh, you, you mentioned sort of the uranium that's, that's in the oceans. Um, I wanted to... Uh, follow up a little bit though on you know health impacts in in general from fukushima because that's been a, a bit of a source of controversy um i know this is an area that you've researched thoroughly um can you just catch us up to date on the latest science on uh the you know the radiation impacts from fukushima there, is, there isn't any radiation impacts there's an impact of the fear of the radiation right not of the not of the radiobiological consequences. So, so there's, was, there's one worker who was awarded compensation. I think he got lung yeah, cancer. Yeah, that's a bit different. From saying that yeah. his cancer was actually um, caused by radiation. He's actually um, he it was lung cancer. He was right. relatively young, so you know, it was a bit surprising he had lung cancer. But it does happen in in non radiation exposed populations. It's not yeah. that uncommon. Uh, and of course, in in Japan, a lot of people do smoke, so he would have been exposed to um, smoke in the atmosphere from mm -hmm. you know other workers, etc. But the Japanese government made a policy of if somebody is diagnosed with cancer, um, they will pay compensation if it was above a certain number of millisieverts. But that is not the same as saying it was caused by um, the, the, the radiation. In fact, it was highly unlikely it was caused by the radiation. But because of their policy, 
And you right. can understand why. I mean, you have a workforce that's fairly traumatised, is worried sick about their health. Yeah. Um, why would you make it any worse for the family if somebody does unfortunately suffer from cancer? So I can see, you know, it, it's a good sort of kind way of dealing with it, but then people get it into their heads that actually it's a, a proven causative mechanism, which mm -hmm. is very far from the truth. So, I mean, the Japanese government's response to Fukushima um, involved a lot of modifications of their um, regulations around exposures to radiation, right? And so, um, and and I think that's been, the, F, the, the idea behind it was to try and sort of restore confidence in uh, Fukushima produce, for instance. Um, I think in the, in the UK and, and in America, it's 2000 becquerels per kilogram. And, and in Japan, they lowered it, actually, I think, from 100 to 50. Is that right? Yeah, and of course, uh, no, I think it was 500 to 100. But, okay. you know, if you if you suddenly say you're going to lower something, then the public will automatically think, well, it must have been really dangerous to start off with, right. which it wasn't. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's, again, it's, it's a political knee-jerk reaction with no scientific basis to it. You can right. understand why they did it because they thought it would improve confidence. It actually had complete the reverse. People got were more and more scared because, well, if they're having to lower it, it must be much more terrible than we really thought it was to begin with. So, you know, I think you have to think these things through very carefully. And unfortunately, in the heat of the moment and with politicians, it's really difficult sometimes to get the science over. And you have to think of the consequences of what you're doing. Um, and, and politicians have a slightly different way of thinking about it than we do, I think. Um, because it was it was a no brain for them. Well, we'll just we'll just say we're doing this because we'll make it safer and that will improve how everybody feels about it. Not completely the opposite. Yeah. So so produce just to be clear, produce from the Fukushima prefecture is like got one twentieth the radioactivity of of produce from Europe and America. Well, that, it's safe levels. I mean, you know, it, it's it's it has there is pass, a, a legal yeah. limit over which you cannot sell something, right. and it's different in different countries. The yeah. fact is, that you know, produce any of it gets anywhere near the legal limits. And in fact, I went to a village um, in the Itati region where the plume went up and they hadn't evacuated everybody and they got yeah. more contamination than they were expecting. And there, there they'd actually got a, um, a, a gamma counter, I think it is, um, from Belarus, <laughs> of all places. Right. And they'd actually put it in the community centre there and people could go and take the produce they'd grown on their allotments, measure it, and then if it was okay, they could take it away and eat it. And yeah. I said to the, the, the head honcho of the community there, I said, you know, well, um, have you ever had anything that's actually exceeded even the Japanese limits? Never mind our, you know, more generous European limits. He said, oh, no, no, nothing's ever exceeded it. Yeah. So you know, it was, I think it was good for the community because they had the reassurance of being able to see that it was not reading higher than it should have done. Yeah. But at, the same, at the same time, it was really quite pointless because nothing got anywhere near the legal limit. It was it was really interesting. I was um, interviewing Ida Rieshelm, who runs the Thoughtscapism blog and is a really extraordinary science communicator. And she has a habit of sort of carrying a Geiger counter everywhere she goes because radiation, again, is something we can't we can't sense. Um, and I mean, she was talking about um, she used to, she stopped leaving it on um, overnight at her bedside because a stray cosmic ray hit it and set off an alarm on it. Um, <laughs> I can I, imagine that was quite terrifying in the middle of the night. Beep beep beep. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think you know it's really she she did a trip to Chernobyl and measured all of her exposures, and of course, the highest exposure was the flight there. Um, yeah. So that that was interesting. But I think you know this. There's, there's so many different um, units to describe. Um, radiation, the biological effects of radiation, the absorbed doses. Becquerel's is, is interesting. Can you can you explain that to us? Because when you hear 2000 or 500 or 100, if you're someone who doesn't think that radiation is natural and all around us, um, yeah, explain well, Becquerel for us. Now I'm going to show you exactly how old I am. In the early days, sure. <laughs> we used to use uh, curies as, a me as the measure of radioactivity. Then it swapped to becquerels, and and the change in the and the, the magnitude of the number was huge. Right. I can't remember offhand what it was now because I'm so focused on becquerels now. But you you were adding zeros to, to numbers that you used to be dealing with in the lab, and and in fact there was a saying, and I'm I'm not sure that this will be able to go out, but we referred to them as bugger alls because they really were such a small amount of radiation compared with the curies that we've been used to working in. Right. And I think. That, that's part of the problem. When you use a unit that uses sort of several orders of magnitude to, 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 to be sort of written down on a piece of paper, 
it looks massive and therefore if it's big it's frightening right where actually what you're talking about is a disintegration a second right. which is very very small amounts of radiation in turn and in, and then again you can't just take a becquerel and say it's that dose right you have to know all about the half-life of the isotope that you're dealing with. You have to know whether it's concentrated in the body. You have to know what type of radiation it emits. You have to know the energy if it's a beta. Right. And then you can start to make some decisions about the dose that you are likely to get. And of course, you have to know the biological and, and, and physical half-life relationship. So yeah. we use Becquerels to, to talk about radioactivity and their big numbers. But when you actually translate that into what it means in terms of dose to a given tissue, and if it's the dose to the tissue that's going to govern the effect that you're going to have in health, then you actually get around to tiny, tiny doses of radiation, which actually really have very little effect, if any, that you will ever see in uh, a human exposure situation. And I think what's extraordinary is just like, you know, we went from not, not being able to measure radiation at all beyond, I think there was the skin erythema test where, you know, x-ray technicians would sort of calculate those by seeing when they got a sunburn from, uh, from radiation to, you know, um, measurement devices that can, that can measure a single atomic decay. And, you know, I mean, I, I was struck by this as well. Uh, apparently that amount of potassium 40, that, that radio isotope of potassium, there's 4,600 decays per second within our body right and so in, i think people hear people, man. what's that story an average 70 kilogram man yeah yeah the bigger you are the more dose you're going to get because you're going to have more potassium 40 because your, your tissue right. is obviously bigger so yes i mean actually 70 kilograms is quite small for most right. people like right. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it, it again you, you're taking you're taking a figure and you're sort of saying that but actually you know we don't have any problems with potassium 40 again yeah. because the dose is so small because it has a very long physical half-life and a much shorter biological half-life and i didn't get my head around why that mattered so much until i really saw the doses that come from cesium after chernobyl right you're talking of 10 millisieverts to a lot of the population that was in the contaminated area over a 20 year period. And you compare that with a CT scan, the whole body CT scan is 10 millisieverts that you give in a matter of seconds. Yeah, I do it all the and time, go, guilty. Hmm, maybe now I can understand why this stuff is not producing so many cancers. Right. Because the depth is minuscule. So, so speaking of, you know, the more dangerous radioisotopes, which again, have been removed from the, the water that's being stored on site, um, you're, you're a specialist in, in thyroid cancer, um, you run the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, um, iodine-131 definitely has been associated with upticks in cancer. Can you kind of, I guess, compare and contrast that to tritium? Because you, you yeah, mentioned, the, you, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It, it's interesting, because, you know, iodine, Although, you know, we say it causes cancer, it only causes cancer in young people. You have to be young when you're exposed. Right. Um, it, I remember having a long conversation with one of the radiation protection officers, because everybody assumes that if you get a, a change in the DNA, you get cancer. If only biology was that simple. It is really not that simple. It matters at what stage your body is when you're exposed. And for something like um, thyroid, you can easily understand that because the thyroid is still growing in young people. It isn't growing when you get to over 20. Mm. My, mine shot, mine's starting to sort of lose cells like mad now. And we know that, that hypothyroidism is, is an issue in older people because their thyroid cells are, are, are falling off their, their perches and not right. being replaced because the thyroid isn't, isn't re being replaced at all. So you can understand that actually growth is a very key thing to giving you cancer. So if you're young and your thyroid's growing, you're going to be much more at risk of developing cancer than if you're my age or your age. And iodine-131, um, you're, you're comparing uh, tritium uh, with the biological half-life um, yeah. of, of seven yeah. to 14 days and the-, the... And with, with iodine, it's an eight day half-life physically, right. but a yeah. hundred day half-life biologically. So it's the complete opposite. So it's so in your here, body way longer decaying. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's going to give up its, its radiation while it's inside. And also it's concentrated in one single tissue in your body. It right. goes to your thyroid. Your thyroid is an, is an iodine sponge. It will take any iodine it can find because normally iodine is fairly rare in the environment. So right. it's developed a mechanism because it needs iodine to produce its hormones, whereby it can sequester and hold on to iodine. Right. to make sure that they can, it can produce its thyroid hormones, which run your metabolism. So if you're slightly iodine 
deficient, which areas around Chernobyl certainly were iodine deficient, your thyroid is going to think whoopee as soon as it sees a whole high amount of radio iodine and sequester that as much as, as it possibly can until the gland is completely flooded with iodine. Right. And it's completely different in Japan where they're iodine replete. So they probably couldn't have taken up much radio iodine had it been released in sufficient quantities anyway, because all of their thyroid was completely bound up with normal iodine. Right. So they've, they've already sort of taken the potassium pill in a sense that, that people are offered that live around nuclear power yeah. plants. Yeah, Al almost. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then, I mean, that's, that's also, I mean, again, I'm not an endocrinologist. I don't treat thyroid cancer, but from what I understand, it's one of the most treatable cancers because it's almost the perfect chemotherapy. I mean, we want targeted chemotherapy that only kills the cancer cells. So can you explain how iodine yeah. 131 does that? Well, I, ironically, because the thyroid is the one tissue in the body that takes up iodine, as long as the cells that are in the, in the cancer still carry on doing that, and in most cases they do, it will take up any radioactive iodine. If you give a high enough dose, obviously you're going to damage the DNA, DNA of the cells so much that the uh, cells will effectively um, apoptose and, and die. You're, you're, you're using it like a sterilizing agent, basically. Right. Um, the same way that we give, you know, um, gamma radiation to, to patients to for breast cancer and things like that. We, but it's with iodine, we can target it directly to the thyroid because it's the only tissue that really takes it up in great quantities. It's the it takes it up and binds it. The right. you know, salivary gland also takes it up, and the lactating mammary gland will take it up, but it doesn't bind it and keep it inside the cell and right. inside the follicle in the, in the same way that the, the thyroid does. And it's that keeping it within the gland is what gives us that longer biological half-life relevant, relevant to its, uh, relative to its physical half-life. Right. And that's why it is such a targeted treatment. Um, and ironically, you know, only about 1% mortality with thyroid cancer. So it's, it's a pretty good treatment. If we could treat all cancers like that, we'd be very, very happy. Right. So, you know, I, th I think something that's striking is the sort of fear mongering that's that's going on from, uh, you know, Greenpeace. I haven't looked at everybody that's fear mongering, but I would I would guess that that would include the usual suspects like Helen Caldicott, um, my erstwhile colleague. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's interesting because you, you mentioned, I think, in both the Chernobyl and Fukushima um, UN SCAR reports, which are really you know, we had you on, on on our last episode together, which was looking at the quality of the scientific evidence. Um, around these accidents, because you have reports that were commissioned by the European Green Party, for instance, that had radically different findings, um, maybe unsurprisingly, and had radically different methodology. Um, but you know, you're mentioning that the fear of radiation is what, um, and that rushed evacuations are what's you know really harm people from these accidents. You know, the when when I hear people fear mongering, or you know. There's a, a, a low dose radiation uh, expert um, named Chris Busby, who's a compatriot of yours in the UK. Um, you know, and he was spreading a conspiracy theory after Fukushima that they were spreading contamination from the Fukushima prefecture to all of Japan so that they could disguise an increased cancer rate there. And then he was actually involved in marketing a supplement um, that yes. children could take. Which was just, from what I understand, I think calcium or it was just what you get over the counter if, at a at a drugstore, but it was an inflated price. So, do these? I mean, do these people? Do you think bear some responsibility? I mean, what I find yes. amazing is that they their reputations leave intact all the time, but despite the most, you know, erroneous claims. Well, their reputations stay intact with the people who believe what they say. Right. Uh, it doesn't stay intact with everybody. I mean, I I, I really do. I mean, I, I've spoken to a lot of journalists about this as well that I, I feel, feel the way it was reported after Fukushima um, and the way some people acted, and you've named one of the actors there who, who I, I know really doesn't like me very much, um, you know, that just made the situation much worse. And it, it's why I personally got involved because I thought I can't stand back and let these people say these things with no scientific evidence whatsoever. Sorry about the noises off, it's the dogs. Um, and, um, it, you know, it, it was just spreading rumor and lies and making a bad situation much worse. Mm -hmm. Because what we knew from Chernobyl was that it was the fear of radiation exposure had actually caused more psychological damage to the public health of the population than the effects of thyroid cancer in children. More people this... were affected 
And, and also there you do get an effect that goes down the generations because if your parents are worried, you will be worried and you will right. carry that worry down the generations. Yeah. So uh, it's really up to us now as this generation to do something about that, I think. Yeah, a beautiful example from uh, Ida Rieshelm's, uh trip to Chernobyl. Um, one of her tour guides had been a liquidator. And, uh, and I think so, some of the other members of a film crew are asking about, you know, the risk uh, of going to the zone. And this guy was kind of smoking away. And, uh, you know, and, and he, when she asked him about smoking, which, you know, carries a very high mortality and, and risk of cancer with it. Um, you probably know those numbers off off heart, but um, he said, "Well, you know, I was I was a Fukushima liquidator, so it's going to get me anyway." You know, and he had a very fatalistic attitude, and I think that's that's been sort of demonstrated to be one of the chief harms is people feel a lot of a stigma and b kind of, "Well, I'm I'm dying anyway." And and we know that is a, a real problem with the liquidators cohort is is the, mm -hmm. they do feel that you know, well, he's going to get me. So yeah, you know, and unfortunately, they don't have the best sort of health records because they do they do drink and they smoke. I mean, we've seen that with our own populations. Get a population stress, and what's the first thing it do? It goes out and buy quite a lot of alcohol and get into bad habits, eating and things like that. That's just right. the natural way that we respond to stress. Right. Um, but it wasn't. It's not just those people who were actually exposed. It spreads out to the wider population. And I mean, you have a lot of people who were worried about, you know can they have children? If they right. have children, will they be normal? And I, there were people who had abortions, even after the much lower doses of Fukushima, wow. because wow. they feared their children would be affected. And there is no evidence for that whatsoever. So where does, where does that where stand? Does, where does that that's, stand? that's based off of uh, the Herman Mueller um, fruit fly experiments. Can you just go yeah, through a lot, the... A lot of comes from animal and insect type experiments where the doses were massive in terms of the human dose. And it is a, a problem that I, I've seen when I was very young, we used to work on non-genotoxic non carcinogenesis, where you give pesticides and things like that to rats and mice, they develop tumors. And then people will get worried that that would happen in humans. But when you look at the doses, you go, how much of that you really got to ingest to get the same doses you're giving a mouse or a rat? Mm -hmm. And a lot of, I think of our problems with radiation come from those early experiments where very, very high doses were given. And, and the automatic assumption is, well, if it happens in high doses, it's going to happen in small doses. And if you've got loads of people, then you're going to see those effects. But that just hasn't been borne out in, in fact at all. And we know now that very low doses of radiation, we're, we're surrounded by radiation. We can't avoid low doses of radiation. And really, once you get below about 100 millisieverts, it becomes increasingly difficult to really see any effects. Um, in terms of public health. So what kind of differences are we talking about in dose? Like a hundred times, a thousand, like compared to say the dose that people get, you know, from Fukushima or Chernobyl in terms of these germline or hereditary effects? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're talking, well, we haven't, a, a, we haven't seen anything in the human anyway at any dose level. In any human? Uh, no, any humans. So e not, not from the atomic bombs, nothing? No, there's no, de there's no evidence of transgenerational effects in, from the atomic bomb. People who were pregnant at the time got very high doses and were certain certain phases of their pregnancy right. did have issues, but they had massive doses. We're talking, you know, several grays worth of exposure, uh, exposure to, to, the, to the fetus, which often meant that the, the mother had some form of acute radiation syndrome, you know, had very, very high doses. And a, a gray is like 500 times your annual background dose or something. In uh, yeah, your annual, your annual, again, we, we're mixing sort of, um, um, you know, units right. of uh, background doses, about 2.5 millisieverts. If you live in the UK, um, a lot more than that if you live in certain parts of the US, you know, Colorado and places like that, uh, yeah. Denver have much higher doses, about six or seven. But so, suppose to say hundreds of times more from the atomic yeah, bomb. Yeah, hundreds of times more um, in a very short period of time as well, usually. And I mean, we, uh, we see that with, you know, in, in the first trimester, if you take certain drugs, there can be, you know, increases in, in certain deformities like cleft palates and things like that that get us very worried, but yeah. But in terms yeah. of hereditary effects, that's never been measured in humans. It's never been shown, it's never been shown that if the parent was exposed, and then had a subsequent child that that child was affected. So no evidence that from the atomic bombs. And there is a study coming out that will support that from Chernobyl liquidators as well. And how well studied is that population, like the, the atomic bomb survivors? Oh, I mean, we've got a huge lifespan cohorts that are still ongoing in Japan. Yeah. Um, so they've been studied. It was difficult to set them up immediately post-war because you can imagine you know, the mess the place was in. Um, right. and the politics that surrounded all of this. Right. But they really got going in the early 1950s, so actually pretty soon after the end of the war. 
Um, so they really have huge amounts of data. And interestingly, a lot of people think that they are high dose studies only, but actually about 43% of, the, uh, of the, the people in those studies, and we're talking you know, about 100,000 people, 43% of them had doses of less than five millisieverts, so less than two years of living in the UK. Or, from the or less than like half of a CT scan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it, it, we are actually looking at, at really a cohort of low dose, um, mainly with a few high doses because they were very close to the epicenter. So I just want to talk about some responses to this. I had the, the pleasure of having Paul Bluestein on, who's an American journalist um, who lives in Japan. And he was one of the first sort of um, rational voices, I'd say, in the, in the aftermath, writing in the days after Fukushima and you know, researching radiation, maybe coming across your materials and, and really pouring some water on the fire. I mean, the U.S. Army was talking about evacuating um, the military bases there um, because of the potential to get a, a dose that would exceed EPA limits. Um, you know, so this would have, and you know, the kind of shockwaves that would have sent through Japan if, you know, their occupier essentially, <laughs> um, decided yeah. to abandon their military bases after 50 years of, um, you know, maintaining, a uh, those, those bases, some of them, I think involuntarily, um, would have been interesting. And, and so what he does is he actually buys, makes an effort to buy Fukushima produce and Fukushima sake, um, there's a, a, a couple of funny things I saw on Twitter recently. There's a Fukushima drinking team. Um, so people sort of offering to <laughs> take a shot or two of, of the, the tritiated water. Is there any, like in your read of this, is there any risk from that? Is that insane? Well, I mean, I'm still talking about incredibly low doses. I did actually go around the plant well, a few years ago now with, with, a, with a bunch of, of green ac activists who yeah. were actually interested in finding out the truth about ra uh, radiation health effects. Right. And said, like, "Give me a straw, and I'll I'll go and take a sip out of one of the tanks." Because they, you are talking of really low doses. Um, yeah. You know, I, I would I wouldn't be concerned about it at all. And interesting, you were saying about um, you know, people trying to encourage people to drink um, and, and eat produce from the area. I have a, a friend called Jim Smith who works at the University of Portsmouth, who has actually set up um, a vodka factory using grain from the Chernobyl area. Well, wow. okay. Try and encourage people to to normalize it. Right. Uh, obviously, you know it's not radioactive, um, but he, he's actually trying to to give something back to the community there. He studied the wildlife and, and things like that. Right, he's, right. I think I've heard of him. Ecology yeah. rather than than health, um, but he has some stories to to tell about that. But it really is important that we do encourage these regions to go back to normal. Right. For the sake of the people who live here, I mean, one of the problems I have when I go out there is you see all this topsoil that's been skimmed. Right. Now, Fukushima is one of the major rice growing areas of Japan, and it, Fukushima rice is supposed to be some of the best rice in the country. So what have you done? You've just taken off the good topsoil, put in a plastic bag and left it in a field. That's yeah. not going to help the place recover either. Yeah. And the iodine's all gone. The only thing you really, really are, are, are worried about in inverted commas is the cesium. Well, the cesium gives you such a low dose. Why are you so scared? It, 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 it really doesn't have a scientific rationale to it. Yeah. But it has, I think what they've been trying to do is make people feel safe by skimming the soil and putting it aside. But unfortunately, I don't think it really works because mm -hmm. people can see all these big bags of contaminated things, which makes them feel the whole land is still contaminated. Yeah, Paul Bluestein was saying, um, like Gregory Jasko, who was the head of the um, NRC, um, you know, he released some data which was incorrect that really undermined the credibility of the Japanese government. And I think a lot of this kind of overreaction is an attempt by the Japanese government to say, no, 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 we really care about your health. There's no cover up. We're going to lower the radiation tolerances. Um, but again, this has led to bulldozing fields um, to get the doses lower than they would be from an American or European field, essentially. Absolutely. And I think they were stung by the criticism early on. And, and uh, I mean, there was a certain amount of, well, you wouldn't be able to trust the Japanese, would you, from certain countries. And I think they were so stung by that, they had to prove they were super clean. But there is also a clean culture in Japan. Right, right. It, it, possibly one of the reasons they're not so affected by COVID is they wash their hands all the time and they wear masks all the time. Right. But, you know, they, they are super clean. You will go anywhere in Japan and it is spotless and it's a matter of pride. So any idea of contamination in the environment would have hit the Japanese very, very hard. I, I, you know, so I think the government was trying to bring confidence, 
but I don't think it really works. And there are still some people who are scared they are going to get acute radiation syndrome, even if the doses were minuscule. Right. They're still they've still got that dread and waiting for it to come and get them. Right. Uh, it must be awful to live under that sort of pressure, which is totally. which is why we need to do something about this. We can't let this happen again. Yeah, and I mean, why that? Why the scaremongers? You know, I, I think really have some. I, you know, I don't want to call it like criminal responsibility, blood on the hands is, is, I don't know, I don't know if that is too far of a term, because when you, when you like yell fire in a theater, I mean, that's illegal, right? That's one of the few yeah. limits on American free speech. Um, and that's, that's really what this is equivalent to, particularly with, you know, conspiracy theories about Japan spreading Fukushima radiation over the islands to, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, those, they're, they're completely wrong. But you see, conspiracy theory works in all sorts of um, right. guises. You know, we've we've seen it most recently with the, the anti-vaxxers and COVID and things like that. Right. And if you tell a good story and you tell it well, yeah. people will believe you. Um, and the, the problem is that the people like to disbelieve experts. We've got that sort of culture now. Right. And we have to, that has to change. I mean, I, I, I am hopeful that with everything that's happened and that you can see how fast science can move, yeah. With the last year or so with developing vaccines and things like that people are beginning to become a bit more confident in science right um, and you should listen to the science you should listen to the evidence and it should be good evidence you're listening to not conjecture and hearsay and conspiracy theory but it is very easy to get dragged into all of that especially when you're pushing the right fear bu buttons and radiation does push all of those fear buttons in the public right. mind and just to be 100% clear here, we've, we've kind of clarified that there's never been any human cases of um, hereditary uh, effects from radiation. Um, artificial versus natural radioisotopes, you know, I'm sorry, I already know this, but just for the benefit to clear this up, because you actually, I think, researched this to see if thyroid cancers are any different in Chernobyl versus yeah. anywhere else, right? I mean, one of the big questions has always been, and, and people like to demonize radiation, so the idea was that like, radiation exposure would give rise to a really nasty form of thyroid cancer that would be much, much worse um, than something that had, that had been derived from well, whatever causes thyroid cancer spontaneously, because every cancer has a spontaneous incidence. We just don't know what's actually causing it. Right. Um, and so there has been an awful lot of, of, of speculation about that. And the early studies post Chernobyl, people found a lot of fusion genes which would fit with radiation exposure because you get double strand breakage of the DNA and the, the DNA fuses inappropriately so you get a, a novel gene being made. And people immediately jumped to the conclusion, oh, well, there you are. It's caused by radiation and these cancers are different from many other cancers that are caused by anything else that causes thyroid cancer. With the passage of time and a bit of sort of thinking about this, I mean, you wouldn't actually do an animal experiment without age and sex matching now, would you? So right. why did we do a human experiment by looking at childhood thyroid cancer and comparing it with adult cancer? The answer was because childhood cancer normally is so damn rare, we didn't have the, uh, the samples to study. Right. But there is no way you should ever do that. You should always age match. So when you actually age match cases, um, so you were looking at children who were young, who had thyroid cancer, who were not exposed to radiation and compared it with tumors that were from patients that probably had developed their cancer from exposure to radiation from Chernobyl, you actually found that, that they had the same fusion genes. And the most recent paper, which will be coming out next week, which is a, a much bigger a cohort of samples, actually shows that those drivers are the same, whether you were exposed to radiation or not, which is really good news because we know how to treat thyroid cancer. If the driver genes in the cancers had been different, we might have had to find a different way of treating radiation-induced thyroid cancer. But the answer is no, it is exactly the same mechanism that produces the tumor. So therefore we can treat it in exactly the same way. Right. It, it means we should get our very low mortality rates that we've been expecting of about 1%. Right, right. The, you know, just on, a, I guess, maybe in closing a couple more, we talked about the Fukushima drinking team. There was actually, mm -hmm. a, I believe it's a German uh, Twitter account, um, Musweg Gebauer, who has offered to fly people to Japan to bathe in the Fukushima water during the discharge. So if you want to take him up on that, um, <laughs> go ahead to his uh, Twitter. Yeah, at me a <laughs> I think he subsequently retracted after he got about 100 replies of people saying, yes, fly me all. I'd like a trip to Japan. <laughs> Maybe once COVID's over, he retracted. and said, oh, no, it was only offered to one person. I'll, I'll see if he follows up. Um, on uh, Fizzwiz is, is the, the Twitter name. I, I forget the guy's actual name. But I'll give you he another... Was, 
he was offered the free trip. So you'll have to wait two years until they start discharging it. (laughs) And and COVID, you know, everyone should be immunized by then. So uh, I hope he enjoys his trip. Well, I'll give you another story about uh, radiation and, and water and things like that. I have a colleague in Cambridge who wanted to work on depleted uranium right. as part of his research. And he was getting a hell of a lot of stick from the radiation protection officer until he pointed out that actually the amount of uranium he was talking about dealing with was less than a beaker full of seawater. Wow. And, and that is our problem. We have become so fixated on how dangerous this stuff is. We're losing the context of it. Right. And, and of uh, course, absolutely. you know, one of the one of the useful comparisons, I think, is to say, OK, well, what's the what's the health impact, the risk? I mean, even if you take LNT assumptions, you know, which are incredibly generous, this is, uh, you know, it's used in radiation protection as a sort of consensus, but there's certainly not a scientific consensus that it's valid and there's no epidemiologic evidence that it's valid. Um, but when you, you know, Japan, as a result of I think they've only reactivated something like six of their 40 reactors. Um, they, they're in a, I, th- I think they're, they're building at least something like 10 new coal plants. They're importing, I think, $60 billion of fossil fuels per year now. Um, and the, the relative health impacts of, of the air pollution mortality from that compared to Chernobyl is, it's striking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, we do need to keep these things in context. You know, having a bad diet, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes are far more dangerous for you than being exposed to radiation, even from Chernobyl. Yeah, um, and you know, p- people have got to realise and and get a balance over the risks. And it really is difficult. We're not very good at this as a species, trying right. to balance risks. We actually do it all day, every day, in our right. own life without realising it. Um, but you have to remember, we we do have to have a balance in all of this. Um, and you know, it's becoming even more important now. If we don't do something about burning fossil fuels we could put ourselves on a course of this it's not going to annihilate our species but it's going to make life pretty uncomfortable in the future yeah um so you know we we should be thinking about well what can we do to uh, ameliorate those risks and one of those is to use a different sort of power source that does not use uh, fossil fuels which uncomfortably happens to be nuclear power because it produces large amounts of power mm-hmm. you know with relatively small footprint whereas it's and it's not subject to the wind and the sun Right. Uh, of course, with climate change, we might end up with a climate. Uh, we're lucky in the UK; we have a lot of wind power. But actually, if the climate changes, hmm, we could be stuffed if we can't generate things <laughs> from wind power. And we've only gone down that that uh, that route. So right. we ha- we have to be careful that we don't allow people's fears and the inability to put risks into context to stop us moving forward in fighting climate change and things like that, which is a way bigger issue than nuclear power is on its own. Yeah, I mean, it's, on that note, I, I was uh, up all night last night because my, my son was keeping me awake. And I was sometimes when I try and fall asleep, I listen to Václav Smil's uh, audio books. You know, this is an incredibly numerate energy analyst who wrote a lot of great books about energy transitions. And he was just talking about, you know, historically how we powered cities and the sort of power densities of cities. And we required, you know, sort of 50 to 100 times the kind of hinterland to extract all the biomass to fuel kind of our medieval or pre-industrial cities. And now we require between sort of one seventh and one one thousandth of the uh, the landmass to supply our cities. So when you think about how much wind would be required, you know, regardless of the intermittency, um, we're talking about the scales just and it, and it reminds me of this kind of uh, innumeracy. And, and I don't say that too pejoratively, because I'm enumerate on a variety of different things. Like when you deep dive a topic, you start to understand it, you can make links between okay this big number i can compare it to this other thing and okay it's comprehensible now but cognitively human beings just really struggle with understanding big numbers and you said you know we make risk decisions all the time it's easy to decide whether we're going to cross the road if that car is far enough away what speed it's moving at like we evolved to assess that i guess with saber-toothed tigers chasing us um but you know with these with these kind of concepts it's difficult and i guess i'll just close with um, asking you, I guess, you know, how's the science communication going? Any, any tips? Um, do you feel like you're, you're breaking through? And also, I mean, we talked about people's reputations being intact, despite saying really horrific things. I mean, as you mentioned, not amongst scientific circles, but broadly, I mean, h- how many um, honorary doctorates has, I, I witnessed Helen Collagot getting given an honorary doctorate at my alma mater. Um, how are you received as, as someone who, you know, makes the makes the sort of science-based arguments that you do and, and defends nuclear energy. 
um, well, depends on which side of the camp you are. Right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people who are quite pleased to have somebody speak up um, and do listen to what I say and get in contact and, and talk things through with me. There's an awful lot of people um, who, uh, shall I say, are, are not particularly pleasant towards me. Um, the various things have happened. I'm, I'm coming to the end of my research career now, but uh, things like uh, gross misconduct cases brought against me at my wow. university and things like that. So, I mean, the university handled it beautifully, but you know, it's stressful and it's not nice. Um, and at times you do feel like giving this all up. But, and you know, at times I do think, right, well, next year I actually take full retirements. Shall I just go away and do something different? <laughs> and but then, then you see something in the media and you think, well, I can't allow that to go unchallenged. I mean, I, I have a great belief that science is what's going to get us out of a mess. Right. The, you know, it's the only thing that is going to, to keep our species going. And it's, it's, you know, we have to look at the science, make decisions from the science and persuade the politicians to take decisions based on the science. Right. And sometimes that, that's pretty hard. But if, if nobody comes out of their labs and talks about the science, what's the point in doing science anyway? Because it's not going to change or influence anything. Mm -hmm. So you have to take that step, but at times it, it's really hard. You do think, why am I doing this? Right. Um, and I would advise any youngster, grow a thick skin before you go out there if you're going to be controversial because you will get things thrown at you. Right. Okay, well, I think that's a great place to leave it, Geraldine. I, uh, you know, I'd intended this to be a, what I call a decouple short, which is under 15 minutes, but that's just impossible with you. Um, <laughs> so much to learn. Uh, it's great touching bases with you again. And, and you know, thanks for all that you do. Um, and, and I hope to have you back. I understand there's some new data coming out about the liquidator cohorts at, at Chernobyl, and I'm, I'm always interested in, in following up on that. Um, so I look forward to having you back soon, if you'll oblige. I'm more than happy. Thanks very much, Chris. Okay, take good care, Jolene. Take care then. If you enjoyed the podcast, please make sure to subscribe, like, and review us on your podcast platform of choice. Until next time, guys. <laughs>